about my self-made car. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this was a car I made about 5 years back. I uploaded a few videos on it about how I made it and stuff. Uh, but since then the car got a little abandoned because I wasn't here. Um, so it was covered in a pile of dust, a few parts were missing and a few things stopped working. Uh, but my brother decided to restore the car and get it functional again. Uh, now, my brother isn't really a car guy so he had to take a bit of help from a few other mechanics. And even they couldn't finish everything so I had to uh, do some work on it myself. So yeah, this video is just going to be a short update on the car about what's changed on the car since I made it. And also you guys can enjoy some of my um, indoor donut videos. So starting off with the changes, if you remember from the previous videos, um, the car had a manual transmission which I had converted to an automated manual transmission uh, by using two motors. So basically there were two motors at the back and one motor would move the gear lever side to side and the other motor would move it forwards and backwards and there was a circuit controlling all this. Uh, so it would basically work as an automated manual transmission. Uh, the shifts were still a little on the slow side. Here's a video to show you what the transmission shifted like. But I believe that if I had a bit more time to program the thing properly, I could have made it shift a lot faster. Uh, but what ended up happening anyways was that my brother decided to get rid of the manual transmission and put in a simple automatic. Um, because when he was restoring the car, they had to rewire everything. And the mechanics couldn't figure out the wires for all of this. Um, so yeah, they just decided to put in a simple automatic. Uh, which I wasn't too happy about at first, but later when I drove the car, the automatic transmission did make it a lot easier to drive the car. Um, so in that case, it was a good thing. So once most of the transmission work was done, I had to do the job of um, putting the turbo back in and uh, connecting the pipes. Um, because the turbo was also taken off when they were doing the transmission work. Um, so basically I just had to put that cone air filter on one side of the turbo and then link the turbo to the engine. Um, so that was obviously simple enough. Uh, but this time, talking about boost levels, I kept it really safe. I just um, kept it at 4 PSI. Um, last time I was actually surprised at how much abuse this engine took because uh, last time when I was driving this car, I had the turbo boosted all the way up to 9 PSI. Uh, without an intercooler because the intercooler I had an intercooler before but the intercooler radiator broke off because I had a bit of a crash um, But after that I never bothered putting an intercooler in um, so I was running the turbo without an intercooler at 9 psi on stock internals And I was revving this engine all the way to 9,000 rpm and nothing on the engine broke That was the most surprising thing. I never dynoed the engine. So I'm not sure how much power it was making Here's an older video of um, back when I was revving this engine all the way up to 9000 RPM and running 9 PSI of boost. Um, you can literally hear how high the engine is revving in this video. So yeah, that was the most surprising part. This engine did not blow up no matter what I did to it. Um, so the reason I was trying to blow the engine up initially was that um, I wanted an excuse to basically go with a bigger engine, a B18 or a K-series engine. but. Um, I was surprised how much abuse these Honda D-Series engines can take. Um, this time obviously I didn't go that extreme with everything. Um, the main reason was that because I had an automatic transmission, I couldn't increase the rev limit over 7000 RPM because it would shift at 7000. Um, and because I knew I wouldn't make the same power now anyways, that's why I just um, stopped that 4 PSI. I didn't want to go anything higher than that. But that said, even at 4 PSI, the car was really fast. Like It was pretty scary to drive it. Um, in this video, I think I was accelerating from uh, 40 to 130, um, so you can just tell how quickly this car accelerates. It's pretty quick. So now talking about suspension, this car had a push rod suspension on all four wheels, um, and I was using shocks from a motorcycle. Since this car was so light, even shocks from a motorcycle were good enough to use in this car. I wouldn't say the suspension was particularly well made, I just uh, made the rockers out of round tubing because that's what I had at that time. Um, but still, uh, the good thing was the suspension did work really well on this car. And the good thing about a pushrod suspension is that it made things really easy to adjust. So this whole long slot is basically where I could move the shock to different um, levels and that would basically adjust the stiffness. 
and same with the rear suspension the rear suspension was also adjustable um, so that gave me a lot of adjustability to basically control the balance of the car to make the front stiffer or the rear softer then that would actually make a noticeable difference when I would go out and actually try the car like this was a car with a 70-30 weight distribution so 70% of the weight of the car is on the rear axle so theoretically this car should have tons of oversteer but in this video I had the suspension set up for just a bit of understeer um, so you can see that the car is not oversteering at all um, even with 70% of the weight at the back um, so that's really the amazing thing about suspension settings that you can completely change the balance of the car just by changing a few settings now obviously you can make the car oversteer if you want to just by giving it more power um, but at least the car doesn't try to snap out on its own when you're taking a corner or something Now another change I made this time was that I changed the position of the ball joint on the rear tie rod end. Um, this is because before the suspension had a bit of bump steer. Bump steer is basically when you go over bumps and your wheel moves up and down. It also changes a bit of toe angle and that obviously causes an instability. Basically what I did this time was I just changed the position of the inside ball joint just by a little bit and that made all the difference. Um, I think I had to change it by a centimeter or something and um, it was surprising the difference it made because um, once I changed that the car became really stable going over bumps and at high speed um, so it was pretty surprising. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about suspension geometry in this video and well, why it affects the car but I'll probably end up making a different video on suspension geometry because it is a really interesting topic. Um, I already made a different video on springs and anti-roll bars and um, how they can help you change um, set up your car. So I'll link that in the description if you want to see that, but um, later on I'll I think I'll probably also end up making a different video on suspension geometry. So yeah, I have to say this time I did enjoy driving the car an awful lot. Um, I um, also did a lot of donuts and um, tried drifting it, but it's a really difficult car to drift. Um, and even all my friends that drove it, they were also blown away by how fast the car was with um, just a 4 cylinder engine. So talking about what happened to the car, um, one day I was driving the car a bit too fast and um, I gave it way too much power coming out of a corner and I lost control of the car and it crashed. So that was a really stupid thing to do, um, just went on the power way too early while the car was still turning. Um, both rear wheels were slipping so the car just snapped into an oversteer, I tried to fix it in time but um, just couldn't fix it and the car um, just went straight into the curb. Now I thought there would be a lot of damage on the car because that was a pretty big impact when the car went into the curb. Um, but to my surprise there wasn't really much damage. Um, the only damage that was was that the rear suspension was um, out of alignment because um, the tie rod had bent a little um, so the toe was out. Uh, both tires um, blew when they hit the curb and also the rims, uh, the wheels uh, were bent a little. Um, but other than that, there was no damage on the car, so that was really surprising. I was also worried the cops would give me a lot of trouble for this, um, for crashing an unregistered, uninsured car. Um, but luckily, they let me go. Um, obviously, the other guy I crashed into, I had to um, pay him for the damages. But other than that, I didn't really get into any trouble, so that was really good. And um, the amazing thing was I was able to drive the car back even with um, two flat tires. Uh, I guess because the car is really light, so even with flat tires, I just drove it slowly and I was able to uh, make it back. Now for the damages, the wheel alignment at the back was really easy to fix. I just um, smacked the tie rod with the hammer a few times and that was enough to um, fix it. Um, but I didn't bother um, changing the wheels and tires and um, driving the car again. I was too afraid to drive it anyways after the crash, but even though it was completely my fault for that crash. But if I do uh, drive the car again, what I will do is I'll definitely put it on some better tires because these rear tires were gone after all those um, uh, drifts and burnouts and everything. Um, so it definitely needs some better tires at the back. But other than that, I don't think I would make any more changes to the car because I just want to enjoy driving the car now. I think it's a pretty good car. Um, feels really stable, feels really good to drive. It's really fun and it's fast enough anyways. Um, so I don't think I'll bother making it any more powerful or anything because that's just going to make it more dangerous in the end. So yeah, that's all the changes for now and I guess I'll end it with another um, indoor donut video.